This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today we've got a special guest on the podcast. His name is Tom Rayner. So he is an author, church consultant, and former pastor, and the founder and CEO of Church Answers. So Church Answers is an online community and resource for church leaders. And prior to founding Church Answers, Rayner served as president and CEO of Lifeway Christian Resources, which most of you are familiar with. And before going to Lifeway, he served at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary for 12 years, where he was the founding dean of the Billy Graham School of Missions and Evangelism. He is a 1977 graduate of the University of Alabama and earned his Master's of Divinity and PhD degrees from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And he's also written three number one bestselling books. So those are I Am a Church Member, Autopsy of a Deceased Church, and Simple Church. And he's also the author of the brand new book, which is out now called I Am a Christian, discovering what it means to follow Jesus together with fellow believers. And, you know, I really enjoyed my time with him today. He's also the host of the Rainer on Leadership Rainer on Leadership podcast. There, nailed it. Guys, all that will be in the show notes. But I really enjoyed my time with him today because, you know, we weaved into all these other different subject matters. You know, I talked to him about, you know, how did you become a, a church consultant? Because I don't know that I've ever specifically talked to one of those. I really liked his answer to that. But we looked at some trends while he was running this consulting firm for about 15 years about, you know, what did healthy churches do during that time period? We also looked at what were the churches where the men were flourishing, right? So it's men's ministry versus man-friendly churches. We also talked about the seeker-sensitive model, kind of, you know, the TED Talk church versus the expository teaching and preaching church. And so we got into the details there and kind of what has the, what has the trends been since the early 2000s in those areas. But then we spent most of our time on the new book, I Am a Christian, what that book was about. We talked specifically about different uh, cultures and different belief systems and kind of how the, the church in modernity is downstream from culture. We talked about, you know, church hurt and how that's become kind of a catch-all category, even if there's not actually church hurt going on. We talked about the importance of the local church because you have a lot of people out there saying, ah, the local church isn't really that big a deal. That was something they needed 2,000 years ago, but I'm going to do me. I'm going to do my own thing now. You know, we got into, you know, how we need to be evangelistic even in our relationships. We talked about the liberalization of seminaries and there's probably a bunch of other stuff that I can't quite remember at this point, but I really did enjoy my time with Tom. So guys, without further ado, let's get into it. Tom Rayner, welcome to Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Thank you for having me. Great to be with you. And this is my first time on this podcast, so I'm interested to see what you say and what you ask. So we'll, well find out what happens. We're going to find out because if you only come on once, we can just assume that everyone's like, all right, Tom didn't like Kyle, so we'll see what kind of trouble we can get into today. But let's uh, let's find a soft place to land, at least here initially. So you're a pastor author and church consultant, but I'm assuming you didn't want to be all those things whenever you were growing up as a little boy. So how in the world does someone become all of those things? Well, present tense, I am not a pastor. Okay, I, I was in the business world. From there, I went to seminary. Then I became a pastor of four churches. From there, I went to be dean of a seminary. So I went to the world of academia where I was a terrible match, terrible match mm. for the world of academia. But it was a good 12 years, so I stayed long enough and enjoyed my time there. From there, I went to be president of a company called Lifeway. And then this phase of life, I am president, founder, and CEO of a company called Church Answers. So that's my background, Cal. Most of it's pretty boring, so uh, I don't really have a whole lot more to say. My, my three sons will tell me, hey, come on, Dad, you are one of the most boring people we've ever heard. Just make it short and simple. So that's what I'm doing. Well, you at least kept it short and simple here, but I disagree with their assessment, at least from the stuff that I know about you and the writing that you've done. But I do want to dig into what you did from, I believe I have the years right, from 1990 to 2005. You led the Rainer Group, which was a church and denominational consulting firm. And so uh, I'm sure a lot of people out there and a lot of people in our audience have never met or talked to somebody that does that as their actual living. But uh, there's a lot there that I want to kind of dig into before we get into some of the other reasons why we're having you on today. But one thing that I was really curious of when I found out that you did church consulting is what trends have you seen, or I guess, did you see during that time period, you know, a decade and a half where, what healthy churches were doing at that time? Like if you were to deem a church as being healthy, what were they doing at that time? And I guess since 2005, what trends have you seen, you know, in terms of healthy churches? It's really simple, Kyle. I mean, I, I, I probably oversimplify it. I wrote a book called Simple Church a few years ago, and the whole purpose behind that book was to talk about churches being too complex and too busy. 
And really, when it comes down to the things that we saw in these churches, number one, they stayed true to the Bible. And so they were they were adherents. They were followers of the word of God. So they stayed true to that. That is one of the clear things we saw in these uh, churches that were healthy. A second thing, very simple, too. They were not only obedient to the Great Commission, but they were intentionally obedient to the Great Commission through strategic means. So they didn't just simply say, we believe that we need to be making disciples of all people. We also believe that we're going to come up with a plan to do so. So they 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 really acted on their belief. Now, they were certainly aware of the culture around them. They were not culturally ignorant. They were not culturally insensitive. They realized that culture shifts and they have to make changes on a methodological basis in their churches. And so they made those changes. And again, the changes would depend upon which area you're talking about, but they made those changes without compromising who they are. Mm. And are, if I go back then, who they, who they were, if I fast forward to 2023, where we almost are at the point of this recording, if I fast forward to that, then the the big the big issues are still the same. Some of the methodological issues have changed, mm. and that has been the case. I did my first consultation when I was night. It went no, I was when nineteen. Let me say that again. I did my first consultation in nineteen eighty eight. So where were you in nineteen eighty eight? I was two <clears throat> years old. Okay, that tells you the difference in the age of this mm-hmm. old man. <laughs> uh, my first consultation. I did not know that I was doing a consultation. I got I got a call from a friend. I was a pastor in St. Petersburg, Florida. And he said, our church is declining. Uh, I, I heard you have a doctor or something like that. Does that mean you can help? I said, no, it's not the kind of doctor that can help. It's really a meaningless doctor. Uh, I said, but I'll come over and look. And basically, here's what I found out about his church. The church on the inside didn't look like the church on the community on the outside. So it was a predominantly Anglo church in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood. So it was it was common sense just from my perspective. Hey, friend your church does not reflect the community and God put you at this address for a reason. Mm. And there's a reason that you should be reaching out to the community. And to his credit, the church began to change. They became intentional about reaching the Hispanic community. And even more so they became intentional about putting Hispanics in positions of leadership in the church, eventually even the pastor of the church. So, I got a check, just a very small check from from this church about two or three weeks later. And I called him up. I said, what's this check for? He said, well, for the consultation you did. I said, what's a consultation? Oh, man. (laughs) I really did not know what a church consultation was. Yeah. Well, he told a few friends about my consultation, and they told a few friends. And lo and behold, I am a consultant. Whatever that means, I am a consultant. You know what's funny about that is I've talked to other consultants that are, you know, in the insurance world or the business world or whatever, and a lot of them didn't set out to do that. This was before social media and trying to be an influencer and trying to do all these different things. They were just people that knew how to help people, and then right. those people value whenever you can give them something of value. And usually in a in even a you know the economy we're in now, you will pay people for that privilege. You will pay people <laughs> for helping you do a certain thing that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. But one thing as well that I, I found interesting, and would love to hear your feedback on from your time. As a consultant, but also in the kind of thereafter, you know, from the early 2000s to now, it seems like there's been a movement. Again, I was born in 86, so I haven't been seeing this for as long as maybe you or anyone else has. But we went to this seeker sensitive model in churches, uh, these TED Talk churches that, you know, love to do, you know, TED Talk, you know, help you with life stuff. And we sprinkle a few Bible verses on top so we can keep our tax exempt status. You know, the expository preaching is a little bit rough and you're like talking about people's sin and depravity and that really makes them feel icky. You know, this heavy Bible emphasis, discipleship focused church. But I mean, the very first thing you said, Tom, in terms of a healthy church was true to the Bible. Yeah, And it's like, I, I listened to Alistair Begg talk here recently in a recent sermon where it's like, you can't tamper with the scripture, guys. Like, that's not your job. Like, you don't have the credentials to do such a thing. So have you seen that? Has has the seeker-sensitive model always been a thing, but just maybe not that popular? Give me a little bit more on that. Well, first of all, Kyle, we can look at a number of ways to view it. First of all, we can talk about the difference between seeker-sensitive and seeker-targeted. Okay. Seeker-sensitive model is a recognition of culture and the culture around us. I know for many people, seeker sensitive means a compromised watered down model, but for many churches, it just means we recognize that there are people around us who are not believers, and we're going to make certain that we begin to do things that recognize their presence in our churches. That's that's seeker targeted, then becomes the model where you start compromising and you start watering down the gospel. But let me tell you what I have not seen. Oh, I'm going to say 
certainly pre-COVID in the last five or six or seven years, I've, I have not seen a growth in the seeker model. What is happening mm. these days is cultural Christianity is, is dying. Uh, and by cultural Christianity, it sounds like an oxymoron, but what mm-hmm. I'm talking about with cultural Christianity, I'm talking about people who felt that they needed to be attached to a church, be a member of a church, be associated with the church, because it was the culturally accepted thing to do. It was good for my business. It was good for my politics. It was just good for me to be accepted in my neighborhood. Well, cultural Christianity was dying before COVID. And when people got a chance to be away from the gathered church and the church's doors were not opening during during the worst of the pandemic, mm-hmm. they said, I don't need to come back. And so yeah. that remnant of cultural Christians is no longer there. The only way that churches are going to effectively reach the people in their community and beyond is that they realize that the world around them has changed from a receptive field to a mission field. There are no longer the vast number of people who will come to church just because it's the thing to do. The way that we will start reaching people is with a mission set mentality. And believe me, once you get to that mission set mentality, you start, and I could, I would use air quotes, but that would be so silly. You start doing church in a way that is thoroughly biblical mm-hmm. in a way that, uh, does not compromise. And it's for that reason that the seeker movement is beginning to wane or has waned. It's because we have to reach people with the heart, true gospel Mm -hmm. of Christ. And that's what's going on in the world today. And quite frankly, the number of churches that are closing, it's hard to know for certain, but pre COVID, we were saying there was around 8,000. Now we think it's as many as 12,000 a year. And that trend is going to continue until we fully wake up to the fact that we're in a mission field and we have to act like missionaries more than ever. And I'm talking about the North American congregations right now. Well, Tom, it's almost like it's a it's a time period where the weed is being separated from the chaff a little bit into where like, you know, when I'm invited to come and speak at other people's churches or things like that, it's typically in a men's ministry context, which I'll actually you about in a second. I always tell the people on staff or the people that, you know, invite me to come, hey, look, I'm the burn it down and walk away guy because I don't live here right? Y'all live here. Y'all go to this church. So like, I'm going to burn away all the nonsense, like all the, all the masks and all the, you know, the stuff that people, you know, the stiff arms and y'all got to deal with the ashes. It's kind of like, that's what we're going to see a little bit with Christendom specifically here in the United States. And one thing I jotted down as well is that this is that trend that you're describing should be a signal to pastors to stand on the words of scripture unapologetically. And that's one thing that I encourage men to do is if you want your pastor to speak out and talk about these really hard subjects like abortion or transgenderism or the acceptance of the LGBTQ revolution or pedophilia or any of those types of things, why don't you set up a meeting with your pastor? Say you need five minutes, you go into his office and you say, look, sir, I know if you start talking about these things, the slings and arrows of culture are going to be coming your way. And I'm willing to stand between you and those arrows because Mm. I'm here for you. And then you get about 10 of your friends and you have them set up five minute meetings thereafter. And you all go in and tell them the same thing, which is kind of backing into the thing that I wanted to ask you about, which is men's ministry versus man-friendly churches. Because churches typically do one of two things. They either don't do men's ministry at all because they don't care, or they do men's ministry like, you know, once or twice a year, they'll do a men's event, like a chili cook-off or a, hey, let's go cut wood in the woods or, or something like that. But it's not, that's programming. That's not ministry. But then the churches that have the most vibrant environments for families and children and the discipleship and catechism and all that are typically man-friendly churches, churches that think of the men when they put together the sermon content or pick out the songs and the lyrical content and the and the key with which it's sung in or, or tone or whatever, whatever that is. So talk to me a little bit about what you saw, because this is what I think about all day, every day, and to a degree, it's what I feel like I was put on this planet to talk into. But you've got the credentials and you've got the experience with these healthy churches where men are focused on and centered on, and that trickles down to the rest of the family. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, you... Undoubtedly no, Cal. You undoubtedly know the plethora of stats on churches that have men-focused type of ministries where mm-hmm. where the father, the husband, the man has a key part of the church. You know the stats. You know the stats that are talk about what happens to their families versus those who don't have men who are leading in, in such a way in their families. So all of that is true. When we look at a consultation, When we look at a church in a consultation, I should say, we see that again and again and again. But I will tell you this, most of the churches that call us in a sicker state, I'd say about 80% of the churches say we're sick and we need to get well. The other 20% say we think we're well, we want to be better. But for those 80% that are sick, 
we will go into the church and men will be in a distinct minority. Not, not only is it not, not only is it not a church for the men, but they are not there. And so these churches that are less healthy have fewer men altogether. Right. And so that is a reality that we see in these, in, in these churches. And usually we have to start with the pastor mm-hmm. and basically do what you did. And it may be not the same uh, manner that you talked about where someone goes and takes five minutes, but, but we have to say, look, everybody wants to be different and make a difference, but you are not going to reach men who are going to reach others who are going to have healthy families unless you have such an uncompromising, undiluted position that they know that they are standing for something and they stand for something that is important, not only makes a difference, but makes an an eternal difference. So I probably, in fact, I shouldn't say I probably, I know I don't have the knowledge of men's ministries like you do, but I can say from a high level point of view, when we go and talk and go and help churches, that is something we see right away in the 80% of churches that call us that are not healthy. Well, and Tom, with that, I love all that perspective. One thing is also you don't want the pendulum to swing so far in the other direction to where in order to be a godly man, you think that you got to eat beef jerky and have a beer and drive four wheel drive trucks and get in fist fights and do all those different things, which I check a lot of those typical boxes. Like I like to do those things. Those are things that I'm attracted to, but that's not what makes me a man. Like, nope. that, you know, I've heard people say before, that's what makes me awesome. It doesn't make me a man. And so you have some of these ministries that swing way over to that side. And, you know, that's why at this ministry, we talk about, you know, seeking the lion of Judah because the church seems to have cornered the market on lamb of God. I, I think we all get the point, but we forget about the lamb or the, the lion of Judah. And that's to the detriment of the men, but it's also to the detriment of children specifically because children should grow up learning this is when the lion is appropriate and this is when the lamb is appropriate that the men that I'm around, they're capable of being the lion, but they're only showing me the lamb, you know, that, and that leads to a tremendous amount of health within the church, but also within these individual families. And there's a whole lot more that I would love to get into about that, but I do want to talk about the new book and that is a new book. Thank you so much for sending this over to me. It's called, I am a Christian. Oh, you got, you got the author copy. I mean, the advanced copy. Hey, Kyle, yeah, I've got the hardback. Oh, why you gotta, why you gotta flex like that? Okay. Like, I'm okay with the floppy book, okay? Because then I can write in this and not feel bad. But hey, how about you just send me a box of those and that'll be like you made it up to me, okay? Uh, you know, I might just do that if you ask. Let's go. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask nicely whenever we're off air. But I really appreciated this. Uh, guys, obviously, if you can see this, it's a short read, which shouldn't matter to you. You should be reading anyway. But the thing about this is, well, I'll just read this quick quote from the introduction and then I'll let you tee up the book. But who am I really? If we were playing the icebreaker game right now and I asked you to identify yourself in one comprehensive sentence, what would you say? I haven't always been as bold and forthcoming as I'd like to be, but if you asked me that question today, my response would be, I am a Christian. What exactly does that mean? So the first question of the day, Tom, in terms of this book is, what is this book about and what do you want people to get out of it? This book is simple. I, my, my dominant spiritual gift is ignorance. So I do not write complicated <laughs> books. I do not write long books because I'm not able to write long books. I write all these short books from the first one was called I am a church member to this one today called I am a Christian in terms of the short books that I have written. And this is, this has really two major thrusts to it. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean doctrinally? What does it mean behaviorally? What does it mean in our relationship with others? But the other major thrust of it, what does it mean in the context of the church? In fact, the subtitle of this book is Discovering What It Means to Follow Jesus Together with Fellow Believers. I am an unapologetic advocate, fan of the local church. Hmm. So when it, when, it, when it comes down to it, the local church is getting a bad rap. Uh, certainly, it's got weird people in it. I know because I'm a church member. <laughs> yeah, and I right. know that I, I am one of those weird people. And certainly it has people in it who are, are argumentative and sometimes do bad things. It's full of sinners just like me. But the, fir- the church after the Gospels begins in Acts 2, and we talk about the church. We either see letters to the church written in the context of the church or written to leaders in the church all the way to Revelation 3. The local church is God's plan A, and for his mission, and he didn't give us a plan B. And so I am an unapologetic advocate of the local church. And so this book especially has the the angle, if you will, the emphasis 
that I am going to be a Christian, but I am going to be a Christian in the context with other believers. We are going to serve together. We are 1 Corinthians 12, body of Christ. The word members came from 1 Corinthians 12. I am a member of the body of Christ. And if I'm not doing my part, then the church is weaker. If they aren't doing their part, the church is weaker. But what happens? when people who are part of the body of Christ, who are Christians, begin to do things together for his glory, it's unlimited. It is totally unlimited. This book is simple and as basic as it is, is a reminder of how we're supposed to be living our life as believers in the context of fellow believers. So somebody, somebody said, is this a continuation of the earlier book I wrote, I Am a Church Member? In some ways, but it incorporates that and it becomes its own standalone. Here's what it means to be a church member as a Christian. Here's what it means to be a Christian as a church member. That's my thesis. That's a long thesis. No, no, I appreciate that. There's there's beauty and simplicity. I mean, one of my favorite people to read that's kind of in the same vein and in, in your writing style in this book reminded me of him as the great Phil Robertson. And the things that he says, like he says it kind of in a very uh, palatable way, a very digestible way. And it's good to have, you know, the books from the, the Carl Trumans and the Jordan Petersons and all those things where it gets really, really deep. But then it's also good to have one of these almost as a palate cleanser because it still has a lot of impact. So I want to actually dig into some, some quotes and some of the different themes of this book. And guys, just as a side note, there's no way even with the short book that we're going to be able to get into everything that was in there. The book is in the show notes. You should pick up a copy for yourself. I mean, he's going to send me a box of them. So I mean, I can maybe do a giveaway and send some out to you guys. We'll I'm going to send happen. you a box of them. You send me your email address. I'm going to send you a box. Dude. We will make it happen, Tom. All right. I want to read this quote from the intro and get a little bit more context on it. All right. In today's culture, many false belief systems are vying for our hearts and minds. The conflict can be both confusing and overwhelming. Right now, perhaps more than any other time in history, we need to understand the urgency of the moment. So the church, Tom, seems to be downstream from culture, and that seems to have some very degrading effects on the foundations of Christian belief. I think probably the the most uh, impactful question that Satan ever asked in history was, did God really say? Right, mm-hmm. going back to the garden. And we live in a time right now where that's well, did God really say that about homosexuality? Did God really say that about gender? I just covered a news story recently where there was a uh, you know, person over in the UK at, at a prominent school over there that talked about how Jesus was transgender and he provided evidence uh, via artwork and things like that mm. that Jesus mm. was actually transgender and had a transgender body. And that's because not only is the church downstream from culture, but the church is taking entire heaping spoonfuls of postmodernism, eating it and pretending it's ice cream. And that's a little bit of a cumbersome issue. But what have you seen? And I guess, why do you think we should really focus to understand the urgency of the moment? Well, the urgency of moment is if we don't know who we are in Christ, if we don't know what the Bible says we are in Christ, we have lost the battle immediately. So for, for, for us to say that we are Christian and we don't understand exactly what that means and what the Bible says about being a Christian, as you say, st- being downstream from culture, culture will then flood us. We'll be inundated with it. And what will happen is we will become like culture instead of being the salt, the light, the metaphors that go on and on in the midst of of culture. So the first thing that I would say is, look, there are all these false belief systems. They have been around for quite a while, like mm-hmm. since the beginning of the world. Certainly you see them all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. That is nothing new, but the Bible has been very clear. We shall take a stand and we shall be the type of people who not only know that we are Christians, but know why we are Christians and why we believe what we believe and why we do what we do. That's when we become this type of force in culture that begins to make a powerful difference. And by the way, to, 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 be, to be someone that is different from culture does not mean that we're a jerk. It doesn't yep. mean that it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we're turning off all of these people where we cannot have some type of social relationship with them. Uh, quite frankly, in some of our research, let, let me let me. I'm I'm almost hearing my middle son uh, in 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 my mind right now. Dad, don't talk so many statistics. You're so boring. So I'm going to try not to talk too many statistics. <laughs> hey, I, I don't I don't mind the statistics. You rain down whatever you want. <laughs> Well, I'm going to talk about this one. We did a we did a study. We've been doing a study. It's called a longitudinal study where you do it every so often so you can see the trends that are taking place. The first ones were published in two books called Surprising Insight from the Unchurch and the Unchurch Next Door. Those are older books, mm-hmm. but we've continued the, the research. And one of the things that we did is we actually sent our research team out, research teams out to invite people who are not connected to church to church. And 
here's the amazing thing. And this, this took place over many, many months. Here's the amazing thing we found, and we're still finding it pretty much the same today. When you invite someone to come to your church and you offer to go into the church building with them, 85% said yes. Hmm. I mean, that's culture. Yeah. I mean, the, these may have been transgender people. These these may have been people who have sexual mores different than the scripture. These may have been people who are antithetical to everything you believe. But because you're willing to go and say, would you, they are responding. So one of the things I can say about culture is, yeah, be different then, but don't be intimidated by it. Because these people are really deep down hungry for what you have to offer through Christ. So don't be shy. Uh, go out and go out into the world and tell them who you are and why who you you are that person. I think that's an incredible thing and a wonderful thing for for you to communicate to people because that does give you know it gives us pause and Satan loves to kind of whisper in our ear, "Don't ask that person; it'll be weird." Like they've got purple hair and a nose ring; like they're never going to come with you. But those are the people that you need to be spreading the gospel to. One thing that that came up while you were talking as well before we move on inside the book is there's this new trend, and I've had some people on the show recently, and I've, I've talked about this. They say this statement; they think it sounds smart and nuanced and makes them sound intellectual, but it but it actually means the opposite. They'll say things like, you know what? I want to be known for what I'm for, not what I'm against. And it sounds cute. It really does. It's a, it would look good on a t-shirt or a bumper sticker. And then they try to, you know, wax poetic about how Jesus never really, you know, talked about people's sin. He only talked about forgiveness and love and all that, which is really an a-biblical mindset if you actually read the text that we see in the New Testament and see the lives that were changed. But gosh, there's this like therapeutic deism that we're seeing in, in culture right now from these people that are just like, they want to have the happies. They don't want you to make them feel bad. And so they don't want to talk about abortion because it's way too divisive. And they, they don't spend that extra five seconds realizing how they can talk about the issue in a way where people don't feel condemned, but they also understand the level of depravity if you engage in that particular act. But can you talk to me a little bit about that and how that maybe comes back to who we are as, as a Christian? Did you just make up that phrase, therapeutic deism, or have you used that before? So I heard someone else say, there's another word in there that would have made me sound extra smart, but it, like there is kind of this, I think it was maybe culturally therapeutic deism or something like that, but that that's where we are to where it's I've like- I've never heard that. I need to turn off the podcast and write down a few things and go write an article and say, hey, I heard this somewhere. <laughs> don't give me credit either. I'm a ginger. No one likes me anyway. So it's just kind of how it goes. But yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, th th there is this perspective, and you, you stated it right, and I understand the sentiment behind that statement. I, I want to talk about what I'm for instead of what I'm against. And quite frankly, the people who will say those words are the same people who will say, let's define gospel is good news. It is, it, is, it is not bad news. But look, this is stating the obvious. We only have good news because there's bad news. <laughs> and, and bad news means we've got to confront that and that reality. Bad news means we've got to call sin for sin. It is not us being that type of person that is calling sin, sin. Usually the type of people that rub someone the wrong way is how they say it as much as the fact that they say it. Mm -hmm. But even if you say it in all the palpable ways and you're rejected by Christian, I mean, by culture, you still have to take that type of stand and so it is going to be hard. It's going to be impossible for us to be an evangelistic force unless we start communicating clearly why people need forgiveness, because you cannot state the gospel without talking about sin. Mm -hmm. If all you talk about is salvation without a context, all of a sudden you do not have right. the full gospel. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and that's the thing is like, I understand there are people that spend, they only want to talk about depravity and it's like, okay, I get it. I'm a depraved sinner. No, no, no. You're really a depraved sinner. Okay. I just, I just acknowledge that I agree with you. But again, when you don't talk about it at all, because if, okay, I guess it's the difference between saying uh, I'm not healthy right now versus saying I'm a sinner or saying that like, I'm like, you're a sinner. You're not a mistaker right? A mistake is I turned left when I should have turned right. But Correct. a sinner means like from the jump, from the, the moment I came out of the womb, I was bathed in this sin nature. No one teaches a child. I got a two-year-old. No one teaches him to lie. No one teaches him to be rude or to interrupt or to be selfish or any of these other things. And so I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent because I want to keep coming back to the book because there's a great quote from chapter two. And the name of that chapter is, I am a church member. And I'd love to get you to talk a little bit more about this. So here's the quote. Please read the next sentence carefully. 
The New Testament does not have a plan for growing us as Christians outside of the local church. From Acts 2 to Revelation 3, the New Testament is all about the local church. It leaves no doubt that God wants local congregations to be at the center of Christian ministry. And a little bit later in the chapter, you say, your role is to serve, not to be served. Your role is to minister, not to demand ministry for yourself. Your role is to put others before yourself, not to seek to get your own way. Oh, how bigoted of you. How mean. You gave me the sads whenever I read that. Because isn't the local church supposed to be about me and my needs, Tom? Like I go back to 10 years ago when Lecrae, you know, a big uh, rapper in the in the Christian game, he released church clothes. And this was this kind of this whole mixtape about, you know, he doesn't need to go to church. He doesn't need the local church to kind of, he's going to do his own thing. And not that he was the reason for this, but there's a lot of people in our current day, Tom, that they don't think they need the local church because the local church is not serving them. How did we get to this place of such selfish narcissism? Well, we got to this place from the fall. So it's, mm, it's, yeah. it, it, is, it is nothing new, but it has infiltrated and it has infected the church. And if I, I, recent, I recently recorded um, a resource called Autopsy of a Deceased Church. I wrote a book on that same title. Oh, 10 plus years ago. And basically, here's what we did, Cal. Our team interviewed people who had been members of churches that had closed. And we asked pastors and church members of these deceased churches what happened in their churches, what took place. If we could distill it down to the number one cause of death, this is an autopsy of a deceased church. And if we could distill it down to the number one cause of death, it was churches that worship the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. Self-centered Christianity. Me-centered Christianity. These churches failed because they weren't asking what they could do for others for the sake of the glory of God. They were asking, what can the church do for me? To be fair, the church should minister to, mem to members. Ministry is something that does happen in the body. But we were talking about people who were arguing about the style of music, the color of the carpet, who were talking about the length of the sermon. Mm -hmm. And you know the list. I don't need to go down all of those, those me-focused types of items. The number one cause of death in churches that we looked at in Autopsy of Deceased Church, the number one cause of death was a church that became self-centered. And it was admitted by these members and leaders and pastors of the churches that had died. And so we did mm -hmm. hundreds of those interviews and that theme came back again and again. Another theme that came back that you would think would be obvious, and I think they're closely related to each other, we stopped believing or at least studying the Word of God to see what it had to say. Of course. So we left the foundation of the Word of God. and. We were unbiblical in the way that we did church. That, that to me is the reason why we should be saying, we love the church. We love mm -hmm. the local church. It's imperfect, yes, but it is God's mission for us. It is what he has given us. I can guarantee you that Corinthians was not perfect, but neither was well, neither the Corinthian church, but neither was the church at Philippi, as mm -hmm. joyous as it, it was. None of those churches were perfect. And so when it's all said and done, we are imperfect people in imperfect local churches until we become perfected and we see him face to face. First Corinthians 12, members of the body of Christ. Here's what you're to do. You're supposed to function for the gate for the good of the greater body. Okay. Then what happens? First Corinthians 13, love chapter. Now we're talking about, okay, what is our heart? What is our attitude? The entirety of 1 Corinthians 13, certainly don't mind it being read at weddings, but it needs to be read in church services. Mm -hmm. This is what the body of Christ should be acting and doing and how they should have a heart for others. And that is what it means to be a Christian in the context of other believers. And I think for a lot of people as well, they are looking at their church. They go church shopping which I don't think was a category of things to do on the weekend before like 10 or 15 years ago. And, and again, it's this me-centric view and it leads to this me-centric view of who Jesus is. I've heard people say recently, well, you know, people that they like me because they like my Jesus. They like my version of Jesus. And I'm like, if you hear someone say that to you, you should worry about whether or not you're presenting the whole of Jesus because people don't typically hear about Jesus and think, yeah, I'm a depraved turd. I need <laughs> Jesus to save me. Like it, it takes a work of the Holy Spirit to soften their heart. Like, so may, trying to make Jesus attractive, that is not your job. Like that doesn't mean 
put no effort into your church service. That doesn't mean look like a slob when you're on stage with the microphone attached to your face. But at the same time, it's like, we aren't people of the Bible, Tom, because, and I think part of it is because it's so easy to read the Bible. That's why we don't do it. Like I've got two tabs open on my curse on my browser right now that are Bible translations. I got a stack of them over there and I got a stack of them over here. But just like most Americans, there's, yeah, you know, a big layer of dust over the top of it that you have to blow up before you crack it open. And I've gone huge stretches of my life where I haven't dug into the scripture at all. And I said, ah, it's fine. I'll go to church on Sunday, or I'm going to listen to a podcast with my favorite preacher. And we forget that that is not a book. That is not a collection of ancient writings. That is God speaking directly to us. So right true. So now. true. Like, and so I, like I'm saying this to me, Tom, like I'm not holding myself. I'm not hovering above my own commentary. I'm like, my God, how many years have I spent not looking at the word of God because I had other things better to do. But oh, that's great. I, do, I, I do also want to get into something that you talked about in chapter three, because I, I think, you know, the the rubber really started meeting the road right in the intro. Like there was like 17 things I wanted to ask you about the intro, but I didn't want to be ridiculous. But also in chapter three, I saw that as, as a high point, at least for our discussion today, chapter three is called, I am a disciple. So I want to read this quote here. My team at church answers deals with a lot of hurt in churches, members hurting each other, members hurting pastors and staff, pastors and staff hurting members, pastors and staff hurting each other. So a lot of hurt there. The problem that I see, not, not with what you wrote, is with this catch-all category that has been created in modernity that I only heard about this year, and that's called church hurt. Major air quotes for those not watching this on YouTube or Rumble. Church hurt. And so church hurt should be, Tom, a pastor that sexually abuses one of their flock, a pastor that lies about money and steals money, uh, you know, and a, a youth pastor that's doing weird things with the youth. Like, that's church hurt hurt. People that are being put under church discipline when there's no biblical basis for that. But what's happened, Tom, is this has morphed to be, well, the church hurt my feelings. Mm -hmm. I complained to the church and they didn't automatically change everything that they do as a church based on my singular complaint. Oh, the church isn't letting me sin. They said that I can't live with my boyf boyfriend and sleep with them before we get married. They said that they wouldn't honor a marriage between me, a man, and my boyfriend who is a man, those types of things. And so we've created this big, enormous tent that everybody can hang out under where they get to, you know, I guess, deal in the currency of our day, which is hurt and damage done by people's words that they use. So I guess what's our call as people that want to be to the truth and to do things well and to do things biblically when you have so many people trying to hop in and say, oh, yeah, I was hurt, too? Well, I, I, I deal, Cal, a lot with pastors who are on the receiving end of these complaints. Okay. They, 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 they are the ones that if we were to look at this church hurt uh, mm -hmm. phrase, again, I'm learning things on this podcast. I did not know. I didn't even know if church hurt was a thing. So now I'm, 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 I'm I've learned that uh, they, they are on the receiving end of some of the most ridiculous types of complaints. For, for example, I was talking to a pastor yesterday and he said, well, we lost another family. And uh, I said, well, what happened? By the way, this is a good church. It's a gospel centered mm -hmm. church. It's a biblical church. I said, what happened? He said, well, the, the family came to me and said they were not being fed. And I know this pastor. I know how he preaches. And I know that he, he was feeding them. That was just their excuse because he was not doing their bidding. I said, what did you do with it? He said, I was loving to them. I told them that, uh, um, I didn't agree with what they said, but if they have to go, they have to go and I will still love them. And that's, that's my point on this is they did not focus an enormous amount of energy on this silliness that is going on in the church. They were pastoral, they were kind, but they moved on. And so I learned from pastors like that. And when I hear a pastor say that, I know that they can feel pain when people say that. I know that when they lose a church member, they can, they can feel the pain on that, but I, they, they, they move on. Here's the thing about it. In a church, you're going to have carnal Christians or at least Christians who are very low on the maturity scale of, of where they should be. They're going to do that. You're going to have nine Christians in your church, whether you know that they're nine Christians or not. It is going to happen. Hmm. And whether it's, it's a Paulus being compared to Paul or whether it's someone telling a pastor that he preaches too long or that the sermons are, are not effective, it's going to happen. So one of the recommendations I have with the world that are, mm -hmm. let's say the church world 
is this is a reality. It's going to happen. Don't let it be your focus. It's it's a lot of silliness, but you don't you don't treat it as silliness when they're telling you that. But then you move on. So there's so much more that I that I want to get into there. To a degree, shouldn't pastors almost gird their loins a little bit more? Like I, I understand, I don't want to be too demonstrably uh, critical of a job that I've never been in, right? So I don't understand the weight because when you're talking to a pastor, you're literally dumping the worst part of your life on top of their head and trying to get them to help you deal with it. That's got to be a tremendous amount of weight. But for a lot of pastors that burn out, that that go on these destructive, uh, you know whirlwinds and make these horrible decisions in their life. I feel like it's because they're, they're not adequately taking care of themselves. They're not exercising. They're not, you know, eating right. They're not getting uh, an accurate, adequate amount of sleep. They're not taking sabbaticals. They're not leaving the pulpit for more than one weekend uh, at a time. And maybe they do that once a year. So I guess, cause there are quite a few pastors that listen to this, to this, what would be your list of prescriptions of like, hey, here's how you can prevent yourself from burnout. Here's how you can prevent yourself from taking this negativity and then defining it you for uh, you as a person or, or whatever. Well, you you certainly are right in mentioning physical condition, emotional shape, and those types of issues. I want to go back to the first major church conflict. The first major conflict was in Act Six. And it was the Grecian widows being overlooked in the distribution of food. It was a legitimate need. Widows who had come become followers of Christ usually had been abandoned by their families and they did not have support for their physical needs. And so when the Greek widows were, were not getting food and the Jewish widows were getting preferential treatment, it was a legitimate issue. So there's legitimate conflict in the church. It's, 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 it's coming together. We always know that uh, we, we typically know the result of this. They appointed seven full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom to deal with this. So they equipped people to do the work of ministry. But here is the prescription specifically for leaders of church churches. Mm-hmm. It is in Acts 6, 4. We will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Kyle, I got to tell you, in most of the cases where I see burnout, and I don't want to have a universal claim to this, but in most cases where I see burnout, they have stopped their prayer life, and they're not personally in the word of God. So you're talking about girding your loins and being equipped. Certainly those other factors are important, but almost without exception, I can point to pastors who are going through the motions of activity, Hmm. leadership, but they're not depending upon God through prayer and the ministry of word. Acts 6, 4 is the prescriptive basis of scripture for church leaders. I think that's a great word. And, and again, to all the pastors that are listening to this, like you, you know, that like that shouldn't be breaking news to you, but even things that are obvious, we need to be reminded of, because there are people that obviously intellectually know that getting sleep is a good idea, but then they still try to get by getting four or five hours of sleep every night. So it's obviously a good word. Um, I want to ask you one more question about this book and it's from chapter five and it's called, I am a witness. And there's a short quote here. I'd like to ask you about Okay. your, your relationship with an unbeliever must at some point evolve into a gospel conversation. So I think people forget that last part where they do. They they try to be nice to people. They're neighborly. They're, they're, uh, they're favorly like, like to do favors for these people and trade favors and things like that. And there's this idea. I don't know if that came from like late nineties church camp or something like that, but you know what? I'm just going to be a really, really nice person and have a positive disposition. And people are just going to come to me and ask me, how do you have such a positive disposition? Why are you so nice all the time? And then I get to have that gospel conversation. And I just got to ask you, has that ever happened? Like in the history of the planet, has anyone ever just came up to you? Cause they're like, you smile a lot and your shirt's clean. Why, why do you like that? And then you go into this, you know, long explanation and expository description of what the Bible is and what the gospel is and all of that. But I think that a lot of conservatives, a lot of Christians, a lot of people that are really, really nice people. They love doing the caring for people part, but gosh, they always stop short of telling people why they're doing what they're doing. And I I guess it's like, why do we forget that part? Why do we forget the last part of turning this into a gospel conversation? Uh, Because we're not confident that we can do so in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, We are fearful for the wrong reasons that we're going to offend someone when we give them an offensive gospel, uh, Mm -hmm. the offense, the offense of the cross. Uh, you, you nailed it though. Evangelism and lifestyle 
only is not complete evangelism. Hmm. Evangelism must tell the truth about the gospel. You remember what happened to Peter and John? They're, they're, they're in prison for telling people about Christ. This is in the first four chapters of the book of Acts. They, they talked about this, this man who had been healed, uh, who had been crippled from birth. And people were saying, what happened? What happened? Well, guess what Peter and John did? They said, I'll tell you what happened. Instead of saying, isn't it a good thing that we connected with him and we feel good about the fact that he has been healed? No, they said, here's what happens. It's Jesus. And they proclaimed the gospel. Well, the religious leaders of the day said, you keep doing that, dudes. And we're going to throw you in prison. We may kill you. Mm-hmm. Well, they wouldn't stop. They threw him into prison. They had an opportunity for a last defense. And they got before the Sanhedrin and they looked up and they said, what do you have to say? You can't keep talking this name. That was the way they referred to their gospel pro- proclamation. You can't keep talking about this name. And Peter and John looked up and said, we cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. They knew that the gospel was not the gospel without telling about Christ. They had done a good deed in the power of Christ. A man had been healed, but it had to be accompanied with the truth behind who healed him. That's the gospel. And I think what this lends itself to as well is I think you're right that people don't think they're equipped to have that conversation. But what I would argue is that indeed they're not equipped to have the deep theoretical, philosophical apologetics question. True. But I know people that don't have a, you know, a, a brain that could, you know, lightly toast a piece of bread on both sides. I've put myself in that category before, but I've studied apologetics and I know how to deal with a lot of those answers. And as Paul tells us in the new Testament, we need to be ready to, to stand and give an apology to give an argument for why we believe what we believe. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to study church history and theology and all these other different things. But at a different, like, we also also have to be careful with saying, like, or be comfortable, rather, with saying, yeah, I just don't know. Like, I don't know why that is. I can give you a philosophical argument as to why bad things happen to good people, but I can't tell you specifically why your 17-year-old niece died of cancer. I can't give you an answer to that. All I can tell you is that the God that is real is a God of love, and he sent his son here to become the propitiation for your sins and mine, and that is the only way that you will see the Father in your afterlife. And so I think to a certain degree, it's like you need to let the gospel stand on its own two feet. You don't need it to depend on your level of recall, like how quickly you can bring a verse out or how quickly you can suggest a book for somebody to read and how I think that, that that's important. I, I, got, I got to write that down again. You need to let the gospel stand on its own two feet. Would you send me your book of quotes? I would love to. <laughs> hey. I'll send you several of my books. You send me your book of quotes. Okay. What's going to be funny about that is it's going to be a pad about like this, and I'm just going <laughs> to jot down the last four or five things I said that I thought was piffy, and I'll send that over to you and uh, give you my John Hancock on it. But what I think this gets to a discussion of as well, and this has been a big problem for me, so I'm just going to ask you this question selfishly. I don't even care if my audience cares, but there have been huge stretches of my life, Tom, where I didn't read the Bible because I thought, well, you're not supposed to just read the Bible. You're supposed to study it. And it's like, well, I don't have time to study it. And so since I don't have time to study it and to compare translations and to look at the original Greek and all that, then I'm just not even going to read it because I got to this point to where it's like, man, it could take you an hour to read a four, you know, four verse story in the Bible, just looking at the different comparisons and the different commentaries. And so it almost like ties you down a little bit. So what would be your advice to me specifically when I get into that mental mode of, gosh, I just don't really have time for that right now? As you know, I deal with pastors. I've said that three or four times Mm -hmm. in this podcast. And what you just described is what happens to many pastors they stop reading the Bible from a heart perspective because they think they're supposed to read it purely from a cognitive or study perspective. They're used to looking at the Bible to prepare sermons and other biblical teaching. And so they get to the point where they say, I'm exhausted. I cannot just, they, they may not be saying it consciously, so I got to be careful, but they're, they're saying it in some way or another. I cannot just read the Bible and let God speak to me and just let it flow. If they stay in the Bible only from a steady perspective, it is almost the same thing as they're not being in the Bible because it is mm. not letting God speak to them from the flow of scripture. 
I am all for deep study of scripture. I love expositional preachers. I love to listen, like you said, to Alistair Begg. He's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. I love to listen to those who have dug deeply, but I also love to hear from people who are immersed in the word where the spirit is speaking just as they read it on a devotional level, just as they re read it as they would in a conversation with God. Remember it's God's word. And when someone speaks, they're not necessarily trying to exegete for you. They're mm -hmm. trying to talk with you. Yeah. God's word is a conversation and it is a conversation from the true and living God. We can take time to listen and just relax a little bit and not worry about the multiple translations and the depth. There are times for that, but there's also times just to listen to what God has to say through his words. I would advise someone who is maybe doing that to start going through the Psalms again and mm -hmm. just read them and, and say, God, just speak to me through these. They'll even make it through the, through the imprecatory Psalms because they will allow God to just speak to them and then get back in that devotional, heartfelt way of reading the word of God. I love that. And one thing that's been a helpful uh, thing for me in my brain is I've tried to stop saying the Bible says, and I've tried to replace that with God says through his word, mm, because that's, good. that's different because the Bible is a thing. The Bible is something you can set on your table. The Bible is an app that you can open on your phone, but that's not all it is. It is that, but it's also God speaking to us through his word, through his apostles, through, you know, the, the, the fathers of the faith and the, in those different things. And so I, I think that that gives you a little bit of a different, I guess, level of anointing as you're preparing yourself to go into Bible study. Like, again, it's not the Bible says it's God says through scripture, God says through the Bible, like those types of things. It just frames it a little differently. Now, Tom, I I'm looking at the clock here. I know we're running out of time. I know I have like 47 other things I want to ask you about, but I want to end with this. And it, it may seem like a little bit of a divergence from some some of the stuff that we've talked about, but I want to talk about the liberalization of seminaries across the United States, because there have always been liberal seminaries. There have always been people that have been fairly loose with the scripture and the meanings of words. And I'm obviously very, very skeptical of anybody 2000 years after a particular thing was written, coming to me and saying, aha, I have figured out what this word actually means. And wouldn't you know it? It agrees with my political sensibilities. How interesting. But I've read this guy's uh, tweet a lot and I've talked about it on my show. There's a guy that's a faculty member at Northwind Seminary. I'd never heard of Northwind. I don't but know this guy's either. Yeah, this guy's name is Dr. Kevin Young. And I read this and just the, the deep level of heresy is astonishing. I've realized that for me, Gay marriage actually points to a more beautiful semiotic of Christ and his church than a mere hetero one. God's kingdom is diverse in makeup, experience, and belief, but one thing unites above all, love, right? Mm -hmm. And so you read that and it's like, okay, this guy's not only saying that, you know, a, a gay marriage and gay relationship is okay, that, but it actually provides a more beautiful semiotic, a more beautiful picture of Christ and his dedication to his bride the church. You don't get this from a strict conservative reading of what the words actually say in English, much less what they were meant when they were written down in Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic. And this is a concern for me because obviously Gen Z is the most liberal of, of all the generations that we've seen. Their grasp of truth is interesting. The the moral liberalism of, of the things that they believe, they think that you know, you're know you too judgmental if you have standard views on particular things. But I think a lot of this is because we have these liberal, liberal seminaries that create people like a Raphael Warnock, who is a reverend and now a United States senator, or still a United States senator, who doesn't believe in the resurrection and doesn't believe that a woman should be kept from killing an image bearer of Christ that is currently residing in her stomach. So do you see this getting any better in the future? What can we do about it? I see it coming in waves. Now, how, what the next wave will be remains to be seen. You, you're talking about Gen Z, but you're talking to, you're, you're talking to an old geezer right now. So I, I, I am a baby boomer. Mm. I came through the 60s. My most formative years were the 60s, the civil rights riots, the, the, the assassination of Kennedy and all of those things and Woodstock as well. Mm. I, came, I came through that era and I came from a liberal Methodist church as a child. I became unchurched as well. When I became a follower of Christ through the gospel sharing of my high school football coach, and I ultimately sensed that God was pointing me to a seminary to study for ministry. One of the first things that happened was I went to my denominational seminary, a conservative denomination 
called the Southern Baptist Convention. And I went to the mothership in Louisville, Kentucky. And as a student in the 80s, I sat in class and heard that the resurrection was not real. I heard that the virgin birth, particularly as portrayed in Isaiah, whether it was Deutero-Isaiah or Trito-Isaiah, three, the three-author myth, I heard, I sat in classrooms, but I also saw the pendulum swing the other way, where biblical truth became the standard. And those professors who had drifted off in the shadow of German theologians were not there, but Bible-believing professors were. I cannot emphasize enough how important the training grounds for our pastors and other church leaders is are for the future of our churches. The good news is I've seen the waves come and go. The bad news is I don't know if we're going to see that type of reformation in the United States. I don't see signs of it. And so the cultural drift, you know, a seminary naturally drifts to the left. It only supernaturally pulls back to the right in biblical Mm. truth. And so if you just let something go without accountability, without any type of sense that we are going to make sure that this is what we teach and preach, it will drift left naturally. And those students who are trained there will become pastors. They will become alumni and they'll pull their entire denomination or whatever their network or movement is to the left. I am, I was encouraged to find that when after the eighties that we began to see things turn around. I then became a Dean of that same seminary years later. And I saw the revolution where Bible believing truth took place. I'm not seeing those things right now, Cal, but I don't have the few of the future. Uh, if I'm looking from a human perspective, I would say it looks bad from God's perspective. I will continue to have hope, but that drift has happened in many places. And it certainly has happened in American seminaries and colleges and universities. And the thing is, is God doesn't need a particular seminary. He doesn't need a particular denomination. He doesn't need a particular political party. He can get done what he needs to get done, right? Whether we're in the way or not. And I'm looking at the clock and we are unfortunately out of time. I've really enjoyed our conversation today and everything we've talked about, but that's all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? Nothing off my chest. I'm greatly appreciative to be here. It's always good to talk to someone that's 50 to 60 years younger than I am. (laughs) Sounds good. Well, Tom Rainer, thank you for coming on Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Tom Rayner. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So the links I've got for you today, I've got a link to Tom's books, all of them. But then specifically, I've got links to I Am a Christian, I Am a Church Member, Autopsy of a Deceased Church, and Simple Church. And then also a link to his company, his website, churchanswers.com. All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening to the show. We do appreciate it. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event, or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Cutting the Tides, which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album, Leveler. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, Keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. Keep seeking the Lion of Judah.